And thanks for joining us this morning. Doug Petcash will be back next week, but welcome into Viewpoint. What a week it was. The results are finally in for the 2022 November general election. And this morning on Viewpoint, we're going to go through some of the big races. Plus, we're going to dive into some of the big conversations you at home are talking about. But first, let me introduce our guest this morning, Melissa Davlin from Idaho Public Television. This kind of bookends it. You joined us on our on our preview show. Now you're here on our post election show. And uh, before we get into the races specifically, I mean, what are your thoughts now that we're we're kind of through it? The, 2022 election. What do you think? We made it. I, I think that, you know, obviously I'm focused on the legislature. That's primarily what I cover at Idaho Public Television. And I'm so interested to see how these changing dynamics between the primary and the general election are going to affect the conversation on public policy moving forward and ultimately how that's going to affect Idahoans across the state. Because one of the questions I want to dive into after we get through some of these results is, you know, how different is the state leadership? But let's start from the top position, of course, the race for Idaho's governor, the incumbent Brad Little, he's on the ticket. Of course, he's running against the Democrat Stephen Hyde, independent Ammon Bundy. Let's take a look at some of those results from the race here. I know there was a lot of Idahoans that were curious, and we talked about it on our show. You can see here Ammon Bundy gets over 100,000 votes, Stephen Hyde about 119, and then Brad Little far and away with 61% of the vote. I know there were some out there that were interested will little get a large share well that answers the question there you see red from north to south I don't think anyone was surprised that Brad Little won I think the question was by how much and how much the next two vote getters would get between Height and Bundy uh, and you can look at that two ways you know, I know that a few people were like look Bundy underperformed he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this campaign and only ended up with 17 percent of the vote or you could look at it as a very successful independent campaign as far as independent candidates go. Uh, you know, Stephen Height, the Democrat, we had talked about this on last week's show. As far as Democratic candidates go, he was the, probably the most absent Democratic gubernatorial candidate I've ever seen in Idaho. He only got 20% of the vote, it, you know, compare that to other Democratic candidates, which we'll talk about later. Uh, I, I think that is the floor. For, that's the bare minimum that a Democrat can get in this state. Uh, and, and Ammon Bundy almost beat that. In fact, Bundy beat height in multiple counties yeah. across the state. Uh, that's not common. And so the question for me is looking forward, you know, obviously little, he won by, if anything, a, a bigger percentage than he did in 2018 against Paulette Jordan. The question is how much are Bundy supporters going to be able to take that momentum and steer Yeah. All right. Y'all ready? All right. I'll do it. Yeah. All right. Y'all ready? All right. I'll do it. From Idaho's News Channel 7, this is Viewpoint. And thanks for joining us this morning. Doug Petcash will be back next week. But welcome into Viewpoint. What a week it was. The results are finally in for the 2022 November general election. And this morning on Viewpoint, we're going to go through some of the big races. Plus, we're going to dive into some of the big conversations you at home are talking about. But first, let me introduce our guest this morning, Melissa Davlin from Idaho Public Television. This kind of bookends it. You joined us on our on our preview show. Now you're here on our post-election show. And uh, before we get into the races specifically, I mean, what are your thoughts now that we're, we're kind of through it? The 2022 election. What do you think? We made it. I, I think that, you know, obviously I'm focused on the legislature. That's primarily what I cover at Idaho Public Television. And I'm so interested to see how these changing dynamics between the primary and the general election are going to affect the conversation on public policy moving forward and ultimately how that's going to affect Idahoans across the state. Because one of the questions I want to dive into after we get through some of these results is, you know, how different is the state leadership? But let's start from the top position, of course, the race for Idaho's governor, the incumbent Brad Little, he's on the ticket. Of course, he's running against the Democrat Stephen Hyde, independent Ammon Bundy. Let's take a look at some of those results from the race here. I know there was a lot of Idahoans that were curious, and we talked about it on our show. You can see here Ammon Bundy gets over 100,000 votes, Stephen Hyde about 119, and then Brad Little far and away with 61% of the vote. I know there were some out there that were interested will little get a large share well that answers the question there you see red from north to south I don't think anyone was surprised that Brad Little won I think the question was by how much and how much the next two vote getters would get between Height and Bundy uh, and you can look at that two ways you know, I know that a few people were like look Bundy underperformed he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on this campaign and only ended up with 17 percent of the vote or you could look at it as a very successful independent campaign as far as independent candidates go. Uh, you know, 
Stephen Haidt, the Democrat, we had talked about this on last week's show. As far as Democratic candidates go, he was the, probably the most absent Democratic gubernatorial candidate I've ever seen in Idaho. He only got 20% of the vote, it, you know, compare that to other Democratic candidates, which we'll talk about later, uh, I, I think that is the floor. For, that's the bare minimum that a Democrat can get in this state. Uh, and, and Ammon Bundy almost beat that. In fact, Bundy beat Height in multiple counties yeah. across the state. Uh, that's not common. And so the question for me is looking forward, you know, obviously little, he won by if anything, a, a bigger percentage than he did in 2018 against Paulette Jordan. The question is how much are Bundy supporters going to be able to take that momentum and steer the conversation on public policy moving forward? Because 100,000 people, that's not a small amount of people, and percentage-wise, you know, 17%, whatever, 100,000 people decided that, you know, conservatives, you can imagine, decided that Brad Little was not the candidate for them. And we know that, you know, no one really expected Ammon Bundy to win the governor's race, but the question is, what does he do with this momentum? Having, you know, to know that you have 100,000 people in your state that say, we support you and we like your brand of politics, that, that's not something that just goes away. That's not 20,000 people. Right. So my curi curiosity is, you know, what does Ammon Bundy do from here? That's one, almost one in five voters who voted on Tuesday said, you know what, I like this. And, and there were multiple elected Republican officials. Some of them are leaving the legislature, but still, they, they said, you know what, Brad Little's not my guy. I like this, and this is the future that I want to see in the Republican Party. Like you said, that, that's not anything that I think the Republican Party or leaders can ignore moving forward. Because How much they're going to be successful is another question. Yeah. And we heard on election night, and it's the, it's the same phrasing no matter who really seems to be the chairman of the GOP, whether it's Tom Loon or now Dorothy Moon, they say the Republican Party in Idaho is a big tent that covers a lot of people. The question, though, is, you know, you, you can't have everyone's thoughts and no one's thoughts at the same time. You have 100,000 people that are making a, a very strong statement here. And not all of those were Republicans, right? right? Some of them were, say, Libertarian or Constitution Party members. Some of them were independent. But it's, that's a marked departure from how Tom Luna handled Ammon Bundy's announcement for run for governor in June 2021 when he initially said he was going to run as a Republican. He said, Ammon Bundy is not a Republican. This is not the Republican Party. We are a big tent, but this, this is not us. You're not seeing that from Dorothy Moon. You're not seeing that from a lot of the other elected officials who are either quietly or overtly supporting that. And so uh, we're not seeing that same kind of repu repudiation, and I think that is telling. Do you expect any changes from Governor Little in the sense that we saw this large voting block voice an opinion? You know, in, in terms of you know the election itself, it is business as usual. Everyone expected Governor Little to be reelected. Now we saw the, you know a strong percentage support that. My question is, I wonder if it changes his governing at all you know, going into a second term. I don't think so. He again, he won with 60 percent of the vote. Uh, the, the key is going to be how much of legislative leadership. And, and, and how much the new kids shape those leadership races, that's going to be the real key. But as far as Governor Little's agenda, I mean, he said on Tuesday night in his victory speech that, you know, he takes this as a mandate, that he has the full support of the majority of Idaho voters. Let's move on to another big race. A lot of people talking about the, ba uh, the race for Idaho's attorney general. Of course, Tom Arkush, Raul Labrador. I think we have the results that we can pull up right now. Um, there was a lot of, I guess, conversation into the fundraising and, and really everything around this. But you could see, you know, despite whatever you want to talk about on social media or fundraising, you can see Idahoans very clearly decided that Raul Labrador is the man for the job. 63% of Idahoans, you can see the red across the state of Idaho, say Labrador's our guy. Arkush, though, at 218,000 votes. What do you make of that? Is that people just voting for not Raul Labrador? Do you see some significant support for somebody like Tom Arkush? I think it depends on the voter. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw uh, moderate Republicans, a, a small number of them, relatively speaking, but still an, enough to gain traction, get headlines, say, you know what, we are, we're not fans of Raul Labrador. For them, I think it was a vote against Raul Labrador, but there were a lot of people who did actively like Tom Arkush, his brand of politics. He had a lot of support um, among moderate Republicans in the Magic Valley. He's been involved with water law, and of course, that's a huge issue in the that Twin Falls, Wood River Valley area. I'll, I'll note that when you look at that map, Arkush won more counties mm -hmm. than Stephen Height, going back to that Democratic uh, gubernatorial candidate. Um, and, and you're going to see that 
with all of these other can Democratic candidates, too, that there were multiple people who voted for Arkush, voted for other statewide Democratic candidates, and declined to vote for Stephen Height. And so that's another thing that's telling to me is that Tom Arkush was, was actively popular with a few people as opposed to just checking a box for a Democratic candidate and against the Republicans. And I think, you know, the message is sent, and there are some people that I think lose lose sight of, not reality, but they lose sight of the reality of Idaho politics in the sense that there is a vacuum and there is a circle on social media like Twitter where you could get a totally wrong impression. And I spoke to voters that thought that this was going to be a 51 to 49 percent vote, maybe in favor of Labrador. A lot of people I spoke with, they say, well, they were surprised. They didn't realize how much support Labrador had across the state. But that's something you have to think about. Outside of the Treasure Valley, there's a lot of Republicans in Idaho that support the Republicans. Absolutely. And as you have to remember, too, that Labrador represented Congressional District 1. So North Idaho and Western Idaho in Congress for 10 years and and he was very popular during his time there and so so for so many of these voters you know flip that question around it wasn't a vote you know for a random Republican it was a vote for Raul Labrador. Let's talk about the constitutional amendment that Idahoans voted on. And if, and if you've missed this, Idahoans were asked to vote on, do you want to give the Idaho legislature the ability to call themselves back into session? Of course, before the election, only the governor of Idaho could call the legislature back. But we can see now that according to Idahoans, they voted 52 to 48 percent. Yes, we think Idahoans, uh, or excuse me, lawmakers in Idaho should have the ability to call themselves back into session. Uh, Melissa, we, we see a very narrow margin there of yes and no, but I guess what does this mean for the future of Idaho politics? You know, it's going to be really, really interesting to see how lawmakers interpret that support. That was a narrow margin. And in fact, you know, looking at that map, that it had a lot of strong support in North Idaho. Those were the last votes to come in on Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. But for the majority of the night, that vote was within a thousand votes of each other. It was going back and forth between yes and no. And so there were a lot of people, Republicans included, who were very skeptical of this idea to give the lawmakers this power. If I were a lawmaker, I would look at that and say, okay, that's a message from voters that we need to be very, very careful with this new constitutional authority that we have. But I think the further away we get from this vote, and we don't know what kind of circumstances we're going to see in the future economically, natural disasters, another pandemic, you know, Lord forbid. Um, but I, I think it's going to vary year by year how leadership interprets their responsibility when it comes to this authority. And I'm excited to see what you know lawmakers do with, with the, the truckload of criticism that was pushed on them saying, you're gonna call too many special sessions, you're gonna waste tax dollars, you're gonna do this, that, and the other. Well, now we're gonna find out firsthand. And we saw people like former Governor Butch Otter say this is a terrible idea. The governor has always done the right thing. We're now gonna find out exactly what the lawmakers are going to do because for two years it was hypotheticals, will they do this, will they do that? Now we're going to get to watch an actual practice. Uh, before we finish up this segment, though, Melissa, any final thoughts on the election here in Idaho, November 2022? You know, very different than what we saw four years ago. The highest Democratic vote getter was Tom Arkush, got 37 percent. You know, four years ago, there was a race that was 49, 51 percent between a Democrat and Republican. How that affects the future of the Democratic Party and their approach to these statewide and legislative races is what I'm going to be keeping an eye on. And once again, ultimately how that shapes public policy and how it affects everyday Idahoans. Melissa Davlin from Idaho Public Television joins us here this morning. Thank you so much for your time. You can catch her on Idaho Reports every Friday. They got great analysis over on public television, IPTV. Melissa's going to step aside, but I'm going to join you when we come back. We're going to get into a little bit more of the election results. Plus, we're going to hear some from party leaders from our Andrew Bart line. He spoke to Megan Blanksma and Lauren Nekachea. That on Viewpoint coming up after this. And welcome back to Viewpoint this morning. We've got a lot of results to get into from the 2022 November general election here in Idaho. The road to it was long, but now that we have the results, let's go through some of the top races around the state of Idaho. And we'll start with someone that will be working very closely with Governor Little. That is the new lieutenant governor. After Janice McGeehan lost in the Republican primary running for governor, we were guaranteed a brand new lieutenant governor. We now know that'll be Idaho's longest House Speaker, Republican Scott Bedke. 
Bedke. You can see from north to south, east to west, Republicans really supported Bedke there. You can see in Blaine County and Teton County, though. Democrat Terry Pickens Manweiler did pick up a good chunk of the vote. 30% of the vote overall for Pickens Manweiler. She does lose to Bedke, but we did hear from Pickens Manweiler on election night, basically sending the message that she's not going anywhere. As Democrats are still here to fight. Um, it'll be interesting, though, to see what the relationship between Scott Bedke and Governor Little works like. They have been working together for many years. So this map, though, shows a real interpretation of Idaho voters. Strong Republican state. Bedke will be the new lieutenant governor. Let's take a look at the superintendent for public instruction race. And this is a debate that we hosted here on Idaho's News Channel 7. The Republican Debbie Critchfield knocks off the Democrat Terry Gilbert by a 70 to 30 percent split there. Over 400,000 Idahoans voted for Debbie Critchfield, and we heard from her in our debate and here on News Channel 7 in some interviews about her direction and kind of what she wants to do with the Department of Education. Now she'll get that opportunity leading Idaho's public schools. There's a lot of things that Critchfield and other experts have been working on, but one thing they do plan on addressing is learning loss and the effects of COVID on Idaho students. So Debbie Critchfield will be the new superintendent of public instruction across the state of Idaho. Let's take a look at the results for the Secretary of State role. This was an interesting one because of the retirement of Secretary of State Lawrence Denny. The state of Idaho was guaranteed a brand new Secretary of State, and that will come in the familiar face of Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain. The local clerk that works at the county level is now going to be the Secretary of State, getting 72% of the vote over Democrat Sean Keenan. McGrain says that he helps uh, working through elections across Idaho as he works with clerks from north, south, east, west. McGrain, though, led elections in Ada County, the largest county in the state of Idaho, and he says that during his time, he has heard feedback from voters about kind of what they want to see from the Secretary of State's office. Now that he has the opportunity to step into that office, he says, one thing he's heard from Idahoans that he will address an official Idaho voter guide, something that Phil McGrain says he's passionate about is maintaining election integrity and transparency in Idaho elections, as well as things as campaign finance. We expect to hear from Mr. McGrain in the coming weeks and months about his new role in the Secretary of State's office. Over in the Idaho legislature, there was a ton of races to get into. Of course, we won't be able to get into all of them right now, but I know that if you're looking for your area, you can go to KTVB.com right now and you can take a look at our post-election results. There you'll be able to find the winner of all the legislative races in your district. I know there's a lot of conversation, though, about flipping seats, losing seats. Well. Long story short, it does appear that the split in the legislature between Democrats and Republicans were, for the most part, stay basically the same. Republicans maintained a very strong hold in the Idaho House and the Idaho Senate. However, Democrats did perform very well, especially down in the Boise area, districts 15 and 16. There were some question marks exactly how Idaho voters would respond to the Boise area, but Democrats very narrowly in District 15 do uh, keep that seat there. So with the redistricting, there was a lot of questions about the face of the legislature after the primary election and now here in the November general election. We know there's going to be a lot of new faces at the uh, state house. There's going to be a lot of new lawmakers. We saw some retire. We saw some decide because of redistricting. They didn't want to run again. They didn't want to run against some of their political allies. So when we really get the full reset in January, it'll be interesting to see how this new legislature works as well as how they interact with the governor. Again, Brad Little earning a second term here in the state of Idaho. So, in terms of the legislature, though, let's jump into this. Election night, it can change a lot, or it can change very little. But it's the hours where the prognosticators of political pundits are put aside, and we see what the voters have to say. Of course, we all heard the national prediction of a red wave rolling over the midterms, but that wave is something that you can count on in Idaho, like the schedule at the Boise Whitewater Park. You can expect some new faces, sure, but in terms of what each party controls, Idaho has the same identity, a heavy Republican state at the state house. So what does that mean, though, for the Republicans who control all the statewide constitutional offices? What does it mean for the Democrats who held their own to protect their seats at the state house? Our Andrew Bartline spoke with party leaders on both sides of the aisle. A successful election night for the Idaho GOP punctuated with a sweep of every statewide constitutional office. It's an outcome GOP leadership expected. What the voters were saying is they appreciate the way that the state is run. House Majority Caucus Leader Megan Blanksma adds new House leadership is on the horizon. 
That's partly due to a 46% turnover rate in the House. That generally happens, you know, in, in one of these redistricting years, and new blood is always nice to have. So I don't, I don't think that it's something to be scared or concerned about. I think it's something to be excited about, and I'm, I'm happy that I get to work with some of these people. And while the people are new, the teams remain largely unchanged. Neither Democrats or Republicans gain seats on either side of the state house, despite some shuffling. Every possible seat, every purple seat, we work really hard for. Democratic Party Chair Lauren Nekachea says this was a big win for the Democrats. In a Republican-controlled state, she says her party finds success on the margins. The Democrats maintained their margin in key districts, including the Wood River Valley. The Dems swept the district, maintaining all three state house seats. We put a lot of effort in there um, as a party. We stationed an organizer there. We've been door knocking there relentlessly. Perhaps that was going to lean more Republican, and we just didn't end up doing that. And we're in the process of trying to figure out what happened there. But one of the Democrats' biggest wins came elsewhere. I learned that we can flip a seat like we did in District 15 when we get out and talk to the voters. And when we can talk one on one, we can share just how closely aligned Idaho Democratic values are with just your regular voters of Idaho. Nekachea adds she doesn't like what she sees from the other side of the aisle. The growing extremism is going to be taken to new heights with some of these new legislators. And I think there are people who are frankly unfit for public office who are now going to hold legislative seats, and that's concerning to me. Overwhelmingly, Idahoans chose Republicans to lead the state, and, and that's just facts. That's what we know. And so to say that, that Republicans are extremists or that they aren't in touch with their communities, I think if you go and you look at the vote totals and you look at so many districts were so overwhelmingly Republican, where Democrats didn't even field a candidate because they knew what those communities looked like. We have a disconnect in that we have voters who I think vote Republican out of habit. They have historically. Just if you want to see how extreme the Idaho Republican Party is getting, they're they're telling us in their platform. And both parties are heavily anticipating state house leadership. The Speaker of the House is a good example, with Scott Becky becoming the Lieutenant Governor elect. The role will have a new face, and for the Republicans, it will be who will push their party forward. For the Democrats, it's who they will be working with or maybe even against. So another big question that we got from our viewers is how does the Associated Press call their races? Of course, if you joined us on election night, right at 9.02, we had some breaking news. The race for Idaho's governor had been called literally two minutes after the polls closed in the northern part of our state and really about 10 minutes before any numbers were really released. So what does the Associated Press know that we don't? Or more importantly, how do they figure out exactly who is going to win the races when the, some of the, 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 the tallies are still being taken in the sense that, you know, it takes a long night. So the Associated Press says that they have a perfected formula to figure that out. Here's what they had to tell us about declaring winners on election night. All right, to declare winners, you need numbers. And they add up like this. The Associated Press has reporters in all 50 states. On election night, according to the AP, they use those staff members. Plus, they pay stringers, freelance workers hired for a specific purpose, in this case, to report voting numbers. And there's about 4,000 of those scattered across the country. The AP also applies something called AP VoteCast, a research tool first used four years ago. It's a gauge of America's voters, designed to show opinions about candidates, issues, and the future of the country. I know, it sounds pretty vague. But AP VoteCast uses a combination of mail, phone, and online research from tens of thousands of registered voters, gathered by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago. Their surveys ask a standard set of demographic questions, you know, age, race, ethnicity, education level, and income. There are also a series of opinion-related questions, the direction of the country, issues they care about, stuff specific to their state. They also want to know who they voted for in U.S. Senate races, or for governor, what party their House candidate belongs to, that kind of stuff. Basically, they are looking for tendencies. All of that information, pulled from dozens of areas around a state, gets randomly mashed together with the actual vote count an innovative statistical calibration methodology, they call it. Making the call on an election can take hours, especially in close races. But how can the AP make that call almost as soon as the polls close, like they did last night with Governor Brad Little? Wasn't there a third party factor promising to complicate matters? Well, history is the name of this game. 
You see, the AP keeps tabs on how a party or a candidate has done in the past. Convincing wins, like with state offices for Idaho Republicans over the past 20 years, qualify a race to be called early. A declaration, sometimes as soon as the polls close, give or take three minutes. In 2020, the AP says it was 99.9% .9 accurate in all of its race calls and perfect in declaring presidential and congressional races in each state. So there you go. That's the method behind the madness. And to add to that, Senator Mike Crapo's race was called around the same time on election night, earning him his fifth term in the United States Senate. Many of you know, may know this, but how is the AP vote cast different than exit polling, where they ask people who they voted for as they leave a polling place? Well, the AP admits that the kind of polling is out of date. It may have worked in 1972 when 95% of voters cast their ballots in person on election day, but our ways and means of voting are way different these days. According to the Associated Press, the last midterm election in 2018, 43% of United States voters voted before election day. Absentee, mail-in, early voting in 2020, that was up to 70%. In Idaho, we went from 23% in 2018 to 56% in 2020. Granted, those were the early days of the pandemic, where you had to vote through the mail here in Idaho in that May primary. But the point is, exit polling isn't as accurate as the AP vote cast, and their calling races has become much more scientific, as scientific as surveys and histories can be. So I know there's a lot of questions on how that was all called, and I, I saw all your messages on election night, but there's the story behind that. And if you wanted to research more about AP vote cast, you can read our full story that's on our website right now at KTVB. Com. All right, Viewpoint, your post-election edition is about to wrap up. We're going to step aside, but when we come back, we're going to say goodbye, and that'll do it for Viewpoint, but we'll be right back after this. Well, thank you for joining us so much this morning on KTVB's Viewpoint program. If you missed anything here or anything in weeks past, you can always catch Viewpoint on KTVB.com or the KTVB YouTube channel. And if you're looking for any more Idaho election results, we have everything you need right now at KTVB.com. Well, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for following our election coverage. We're going to sign off for now, but we will talk to you next week on Sunday morning.